Chapter 17, Doffer It had been two weeks since she fell ill, and Dr. Moore still refused to let her return to work. Her mind roared protests, but her legs could hardly carry her to the privy. Her body had never betrayed her before. She despised its weakness, and every day she heard the first bell and ordered herself up and dressed, but she would only be up a few minutes, not even through washing herself at the basin, before the sweat broke out on her forehead from the effort, and she was obliged to let Rachel help her back to bed. There was too much time in bed. She slept and slept, and still there were hours awake to worry when her mind skimp scobbled back on itself like threads in a snarled loom. Why hadn't Charlie written? She should have heard from him long ago. Perhaps her letter had been lost. That was it. She sat straight up. Better rest, Liddy. Rachel was there as always. The doctor said. Get me some paper and my pen and ink from the box there. A little one on the top of the band box. I must write Charlie again. Rachel obeyed, but even as she handed Liddy the writing material, she protested. You ain't supposed to worry, Liddy. Doctor said. Liddy put her hand on Rachel's head. Her hair was soft as goose down. It's all right, Rachie. I'm much better. Nearly all well now. Rachel's brow furrowed, but her eyes were clear, not the dead blank eyes on her arrival. Liddy stroked her hair. I had me such a good nurse. I couldn't have believed it. Rachel smiled and nodded at the writing box. Tell Charlie, she said. I'll be sure to, Liddy said. He'll be monstrous proud. By the next week she was feeling truly ready to go back to work and remembering with every breath her last act at the factory. Merciful heavens! There was probably no work to go back to. Had she really? Had she truly stomped on Mr. Martin's foot with her boot heel? She hardly knew whether to laugh or cry. She sent a note to Bridget. Most of the girls were wary of speaking to Diana under Mr. Martin's nose, asking her and Diana to stop over after supper. That evening both Diana and Bridget came as she hoped. Bridget brought more soup from her now fully recovered mother and a half bottle of Dr. Rush's infallible health pills. Me mother swears by them, she said, blushing. Diana handed Lydia a paper-bound book. American Notes for General Circulation by Mr. Charles Dickens. Since you're such an admirer of the gentleman, I thought you might like to see why he wrote about factory life in Lowell, she said. I suppose he was comparing us to the satanic mills of England. Anyhow, it's a bit romantical, as they say. A book by Mr. Dickens. How did you know? My dear, anyone who copies a book out page by page and pastes it on her frame. Liddy sent Rachel and Bridget down to beg a cup of tea from Mrs. Bedlow. Diana, I got to ask you, has Mr. Martin said anything of me? Well, of course. He missed you at once. You're his best girl. Liddy felt her face go crimson. I told him I'd ask after you. That's when I learned how ill you were. A lot of the girls have been out with this fever, especially the Irish. There have been many deaths on the acre, in the acre. Liddy looked away, out the tiny dirty window of the bedroom. Thank you, God. How could I leave my baby girl? Diana reached over from where she was sitting on the edge of the other bed and put her hand lightly on Liddy's arm. I'm grateful you were spared, Liddy, she said softly. Liddy pressed her lips together and gave a little nod. I reckon I'm too on, to die. I wouldn't be surprised. Can you recollect, can you remember just what Mr. Martin said when he asked about me? He didn't speak directly to me. He doesn't like to think that you and I are friends, you know. But I know he was worried. He wouldn't want to lose you. So, I got a place? Diana looked at her as though she were crazy. Why on earth not? I stomped his foot. You what? I was all fever, only I didn't know it, and he tried to hold me after the rest had gone. He wouldn't let me go, so I, I stomped down on his foot. Diana threw her head back and laughed out loud. It ain't in joke. He'll have my place for it. No, no, she said, trying to recover. No, she said, taking out her handkerchief and wiping her eyes. No, I don't think so. He's probably more frightened than you are. Have you ever seen Mrs. Overseer Martin, Liddy? If word ever got out to that August lady. She stopped laughing and lowered her voice, her ear cocked toward the open door. Nonetheless, I wouldn't make attacking the overseer a regular practice, my dear. Do be more discreet in the future. That is, if you want to stay on at the corporation. The day may come when Mr. Martin would welcome any excuse to let you go. She smiled wryly. Sounds as though I'm advising you to sign any pet you not to sign any petitions or consort with any known radicals. But maybe he meant nothing. I was burnt up with the fever. Maybe I mistook kindness for, for, 
she grimaced. You know I'm not the kind of girl men look at that way. I'm plain as plowed sod. Diana raised an eyebrow, but Rachel and Bridget were at the door with the tea, so she said nothing more. I'll pretend, thought Liddy, as she tried to unsnarl her brain over the steaming cup. I'll pretend I was crazy from the fever and didn't know what I was doing. Can't even remember what I did. I want to be a doffer, Liddy, Rachel said. Liddy had brushed her sister's curls and was weaving them into plates. Rachel wanted to pin her hair up like the big girls in the house, but Liddy insisted that the braids hang down. She couldn't bear for Rachel to look like a funny little make-believe woman. Bridget says her little sister is a doffer and she's no bigger than me. Oh, Rachel, you need to go to school. She loved to braid Rachel's hair, but it was suddenly ashamed that she was suddenly ashamed that she had only string to bind it with. She should have splurged on a bit of ribbon. Rachel was so pretty, for all her being so thin. She ought to have bright bows to set off two silky curls at the end of each plate. They would brighten her drab little dress. But ribbons cost money, and string bound the hair just as well. She twisted each curl around her index finger and gave it a final brush. We gotta get you into school. You don't want to grow ignorant as your lady. You ain't ignorant at all. I see you do you read. You want I should read to you, Rachie. No, I want you should let me be a doffer. Well, we'll have to wait and see, eh, when we hear from Charlie. But they didn't hear from Charlie. They heard from Quaker Stevens. Dear Sister Worthen, Thy brother asked me to look into the sale of thy farm. All inquiry has come to naught, but as I have business in thy uncle's neighborhood on Wednesday next, I will inquire directly at that time. I trust thee and little one are in good health. Son Luke asks to be remembered to thee. Thy friend and neighbor, Jeremiah Stevens. She tried not to feel angry at Charlie for not writing to her himself. He had, after all, done the sensible thing. To the law and their uncle, they were only children. Judah would have to listen to Quaker Stevens. He was a man of substance. She was glad to know that Luke had gotten safely home. She had finally realized that the freight he had come to fetch was human. The letter meant, though, that she could wait no longer. Something would have to be done about Rachel. The promised fortnight had passed, and she must go back to work herself on the morrow. She sent Rachel to the bedroom, stuffed the letter in her apron pocket, and went to the kitchen. She didn't start with the request, but with an offer to help fix dinner. Mrs. Bedlow was always grateful for an extra hand in the kitchen, even though the house was now down to only twenty girls. "'You give me more than a fortnight, Miss Bedlow, and I am obliged,' she said once the cabbage had been chopped and the bread sliced. Well, you were near death, Liddy. I'm not without heart. Indeed not, Liddy smiled as warmly as she knew how. You've been more than good to me and mine, which is why I dare. It won't do, you know. I can't keep her on indefinitely. But if she were a doffer, she's hardly more than a baby. She's small, but she's a worker. Didn't she nurse me, eh? She pulled you through. I wouldn't have warranted it. Could you ask the agent for me? Just until I got things set with my brother? All I want to do is take her home. It wouldn't be for long, I swear. Meantime, I've not the heart to set her out with strangers. Mrs. Bedlow was weakening. Liddy could read it in the sag of her face. She pressed on eagerly. It wouldn't be more than a few weeks and I'd pay extra. I would. I know it's hard for you with only 20 girls here regular. I'll speak to the agent. But I can't promise you. I know, I know. But if you'll just ask for me. She's a fine little worker and so eager to make good. I can't promise anything. Would you go now and ask? Now? I'm in the middle of fixing dinner. I'll finish for you, please, so I can take her over when I go back to work tomorrow. It was arranged. Liddy suspected that Mrs. Bedlow had added a few years and several pounds in her description of Rachel to the agent, but a skeptical look was all she got from the overseer on the spinning floor when she presented Rachel for work the next morning. And Rachel looked so bright and eager and smiled so sweetly that even the skeptical look melted, and she was sent skipping down the aisle to meet the other doffers under the care of a kindly middle-aged spinner. Slowly, Liddy climbed the flight of stairs to the weaving room. Her worry for Rachel had pushed aside for a time her own fears of seeing Mr. Martin again. She didn't dare look in his direction, but went straight to her looms where Bridget was already at work, cleaning and oiling. "'You're looking much rosier,' Bridget said. How pretty the girl was with her light brown hair and eyes clear blue as a bright February sky after snow. 
It was a smile, though, that transformed her into a real beauty. Liddy smiled back. She did not envy other women their good looks, and even if she had been so inclined, she would never begrudge this bounty of nature to one so poor and everything else. We covered the machines the best we could while you were gone, me and Diana, though, she smiled apologetically. You'll see from your wage the work was not near what it would be had you been here. It was all they had time to say before Mr. Martin stepped on his stool and pulled the cord that set the room to roaring and shaking. Liddy jumped, then laughed. How quickly she'd forgotten the noise. Within minutes, she had settled in and forgotten everything else. Mr. Martin, her weakness, the farm, Charlie, even Rachel. It was good to be back with her beasts again. She belonged among them somehow. By the breakfast bell, she was almost too tired to eat. She would, if she could have chosen, sat out the break in the window alcove, but that would leave her alone on the floor. She glanced at Mr. Martin and hurried toward the stairs. He didn't speak to her. It was as if nothing had occurred between them, except that he never came over to her loom to pat and encourage her. Not once. She managed to eat breakfast, or some of it. Rachel was scruffing herself like a regular factory girl, stuffing herself, talking excitedly at the same time. She stopped only to look at Liddy and say through her full mouth, Eat, Liddy! You gotta eat and grow strong! So it was, she got through breakfast and dinner, but by supper she could only manage a few bites of stew before she dragged herself up to bed. Fatigue was like a toothache in her bones. She would have cursed her weakness, had she the strength. Each day, though, she was a little stronger. At first she could not feel it, no more than a body can feel itself grow taller. But by the end of the week she found that she had eaten a full plate at supper and was lingering in the parlor with Rachel, who was watching, fascinated as a phrenologist, sought to sell his services to the girls. Please, Liddy, Rachel begged, let's have our heads done. I know about my head, Rachel. Why should I pay good money to find out it's plain as sod and stubborn as a mule? And such a skin flint a penny would freeze to your wrist before you spend it, the phrenologist snapped. I give you the reading for free, not that there's hope you'd pay. The other girls in the parlor tittered. Even Liddy tried to smile, but Rachel was indignant. She's not mean. She's going to buy me ribbons, she declared. Come on, Liddy, she added, taking her hand. Let's go read the book you bought me. The girls laughed again, but more gently. They had never cared much for Liddy, whom they knew to be close with her money and her friendships. But Rachel was rapidly becoming their pet. How dry her life had been before Rachel came. It was like springs of water in the desert to have her here. She kissed her head that night before she tucked her in. You don't think your Liddy is a cheap old spinster, eh? Rachel was furious all over again. You're the best sister in the world! Liddy blew out the candle. She lay listening to Rachel's even breathing and heard her memory the sounds of birds in the spring woods. If only she could hear from Charlie. Liddy's happiness would be complete. The money was growing again. She had nearly caught up with the wages lost by her illness, and even though Rachel made only a pittance, it paid her room and board. She had seldom been happier. She woke in the night puzzled. She thought she heard Betsy again, that wretched hacking sound that sawed through the ribcage straight into her heart. And then she was wide awake and knew it to be Rachel. It was only a cold. Surely it was nothing. She would be over it in a week. See, the child seemed bright-eyed and lively as ever. If she were sick, really sick, Liddy kept the knowledge of the night cough tight inside herself, but the fear grew like a tumor. She began to lie awake listening for the awful sound, until finally she knew she must send the child away, anywhere, just so she was not breathing the poison air. It will break my heart to send the child away. Liddy could not bear the thought. It might break Rachel's heart as well. She had been sent away too often in her short life. Look, she dotes on me. Me, tough and mean as I be. She clings to me more than she ever did our mother. She needs me. Liddy did not know what to do, and she was too terrified to ask. No one must know. She fed Rachel the pills Bridget had brought her. She had no faith in them, but she must try. She fixed plasters for the child's chest, trying to turn it into a game, desperate to hide her own terror. And she was succeeding, wasn't she? Rachel seemed happy as ever and carefree as a kitten. Caught in a spasm of coughing, she made light of it. Silly cough, she said. All the girls have them. Liddy mustn't worry. Summer was here. The weather was warm. Rachel would be over it soon. They'd take July off, go back to the farm, the two of them. But it was a vain dream, Liddy knew. There would be nothing to eat there. The cow was gone, and no crops planted. Trefina. She would send Rachel to Trefina. But Trefina meant Mistress Cutler as well as that lonely, airless attic. 
How could she do it to Rachel at eight, what her mother had done to her at thirteen? It had been hard even then. And so very lonely. She hadn't realized how lonely until now, now that she was no longer alone. Then one evening in late June, she had just read to Rachel to sleep. Tim knocked on the door. A visitor for you, Liddy, he said. In the parlor. 